People were so pleased to find any solution of the Einstein field equations. They didn't task with physical significance, if any, it had. This was the old school of general relativity that Feynman encountered in Warsaw. But the Warsaw Conference also marked the beginning of the renaissance of general relativity, though Feynman could be forgiven for not recognizing it at the time. A new generation entered the field, a new center of general relativity appeared. Two of these were of particular importance to me. One was in Hamburg, Germany, under the direction of Pascal Jordan. I never visited it, but I admired their elegant papers, which were such a contrast to the previous messy work on general relativity. The other center was at King's College, London, under the direction of Herman Bondi. Bondi was another proponent of the steady state theory of cosmology, but he was not ideologically committed to it, like Hoyle. I hadn't done much mathematics at school, or in the very easy physics degree at Oxford, so Sharma suggested I work on astrophysics. But having been cheated out of working with Hoyle, I wasn't going to do something boring like Faraday rotation. I had come to Cambridge to do cosmology, and cosmology I was determined to do. So I read old textbooks on general relativity, and traveled up to lectures at King's College, London each week, with three other students of Sharma. I followed the words and equations, but I didn't really get a feel for the subject. Also, I had been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, or ALS, and given to expect I didn't have long enough to finish my PhD. Then suddenly, towards the end of my second year of research, things picked up. My disease wasn't progressing much, and my work all fell into place, and I began to get somewhere. Sharma was very keen on Mach's principle, the idea that objects owe their inertia to the influence of all the other matter in the universe. He tried to get me to work on this, but I felt his formulations of Mach's principle were not well defined. However, he introduced me to something a bit similar with regard to light, the so-called Wheeler-Feynman electrodynamics. The said that electricity and magnetism were time-symmetric. However, when one switched on a lamp, it was the influence of all the other matter in the universe that caused light waves to travel outward from the lamp, rather than come in from infinity and end on the lamp. For Wheeler-Feynman electrodynamics to work, it was necessary that all the light traveling out from the lamp should be absorbed by other matter in the universe. This would happen in a steady-state universe, in which the density of matter would remain constant, but not in a Big Bang universe, where the density would go down as the universe expanded. It was claimed that this was another proof, if proof were needed, that we live in a steady-state universe. There was a conference on Wheeler-Feynman electrodynamics in the arrow of time, in Cornell in 1963. Feynman was
was so disgusted by the nonsense that was said about the arrow of time that he refused to let his name appear in the proceedings. He was referred to as Mr. X, but everyone knew who X was. I found that Twyla and Narlicker had already worked out real refinement electrodynamics in expanding universes and had then gone on to formulate a time-symmetric new theory of gravity. Twyla unveiled the theory at a meeting of the Royal Society in 1964. I was at the lecture and in the question period, I said that the influence of all the matter in a steady state universe would make his masses infinite. Quile asked why I said that, and I replied that I had calculated it. But in fact, I was sharing an office with Nerlicker and had seen a draft of the paper. <laughs> Quayle was furious. He was trying to set up his own institute and threatening to join the brain drain to America if he didn't get the money. He thought I had been put up to it to spoil his plans. However, he got this institute, and later gave me a job, so he didn't harbor a grudge against me. The big question in cosmology in the early 60s was did the universe have a beginning? Many scientists were instinctively opposed to the idea because they felt that a point of creation would be a place where science broke down. One would have to appeal to religion in the hand of God to determine how the universe would start off. Two alternative scenarios were therefore put forward. One was the steady state theory, in which as the universe expanded, new matter was continually created to keep the density constant on average. The steady state theory was never on a very strong theoretical basis, because it required a negative energy field to create the matter. This would have made it unstable, to run away production of matter and negative energy. But it had the great merit as a scientific theory of making definite predictions that could be tested by observations. By 1963, the steady state theory was already in trouble. Martin Ryle's radio astronomy group at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge did a survey of faint radio sources. They found the sources were distributed fairly uniformly across the sky. This indicated that they were probably outside our galaxy because otherwise they would be concentrated along the Milky Way. But the graph of the number of sources against source strength did not agree with the prediction of the steady state theory. There were too many faint sources indicating that the density of sources was higher in the distant past. supporters put forward increasingly contrived explanations of the observations, but the final nail in the coffin of the steady state theory 
came in 1965 with the discovery of a faint background of microwave radiation.